Let's begin with threat modeling. We'll do this intuitively. We have a good sense of how to keep physical objects safe and secure. Your keys, your phone, your wallet. You know when it's reasonably safe to leave it lying around, when you need to take extra precautions, be extra vigilant about it. You know the difference in securing your wallet and say your home. Like these are very different things. But when it comes to the digital world, this doesn't translate directly. Um, this is just the definition I've copied from the EFF site on self-surveillance defense. Um, they have some pretty good resources. I'm not going to read this out loud. You've probably read it while I was rambling. Um, essentially, you need to ask yourself these five questions. What am I trying to protect? Who am I trying to protect it from? Um, how likely is it that an adversary will compromise this? How bad is it if I fail to protect it? And what effort am I, go am I willing to go through to keep this safe? That last question is especially important because the more difficult you make security for yourself and for your users, the more likely they are to, one, not bother, or to circumvent it in ways that you did not intend. As an example, let's say I want to, con I, I want to consider my emails. Um, they haven't gone away. Um, this was said just now. Um, Slack hasn't reduced the amount of email I send. Um, who am I trying to protect it from? Spam bots, script kiddies. Um, the point here is not an active attacker, uh, not a targeted attack. Um, how likely is it that an adversary will succeed? Well, that depends on the precautions that I take. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail in this point because of that. How bad is it if they do? Well, I have email going back decades. I've discussed some pretty sensitive things. It would be catastrophic if that was to be made public. How much effort am I willing to go into this? Obviously, therefore, significant. Um, I have a strong, unique password for my email address. I use two-factor auth. Um, it means it's a pain because I don't actually know what my password is when I want to log in. Um, <laughs> so why is this a good idea? Um, this is my email address that has been redacted. <coughs> Troy Hunt maintains a site called HaveIBeenPwned.com where you can see if your credentials appear in a leaked data breach. Um, it's not obvious from this slide, but my email address appears in nine breaches that contain emails. Um, this includes LinkedIn and Dropbox um, services you probably use. Um, this is just one way that you can be aware of when your data is breached. Um, obviously, if you lose access to your account and you find you can't log in or your friends are telling you you're sending them weird messages, that's a slightly more um, obvious sign. Um, this would be useful to keep track of. And I think they have a, you can subscribe to notifications if your name appears in a new breach. Um, but this is just to demonstrate one of the inherent risks in password authentication is credential reuse. Coming up with strong passwords is really difficult if you need to use a different password for every service, you can't remember it. I used to be really bad at this myself. I had a set of tiered passwords, you know, your simple one you use for your desktop because it's physically secure. It doesn't need to be really strong. You can type it with your eyes closed. Um, slightly more secure password when they say you need a capital letter, you need a number. Slightly more secure for that when you want to protect your email. Um, sign up for a new service. Reuse the same password because he wants to remember a new password. New service has different password requirements now. Your passwords don't work. Some of you may know where I'm going with this. Enter password managers. They make your, li make your life so much easier. Generate a unique, strong password that um, that's what I'm looking for. It satisfies all of the inane password requirements you get. Um, these are just some suggestions for ones that I have used personally. Um, these are all really good. Um, there's a debate going on about 
do you use online password managers? Do you use offline password managers and handle like distributing them to your devices yourself? Do you handle backup yourself? Um, that's something you need to ask yourself. And once again, go back to your threat model. Are you worried about an adversary that would potentially have access to cloud services or not? Um, I can't answer this for you. Um, but really, use a password manager. Even LastPass was hacked. People were like, don't use LastPass. Um, I think you're still better off using a password manager, even if it was hacked in the past. These people know what they're doing. They take precautions. Um, yeah. Now, when password manager can't, obviously, you need to secure your password manager somehow. You use a password. You can't protect it with itself. So enter. Well, the slide. Um, it's good to note that passphrases are better than passwords. These are technically the same thing, but semantically have different meanings. Passwords are short, complicated, difficult to remember. Password phrases tend to be five or more words, um, no relation to each other. Um, they don't need special capitalization. And that combination has significantly higher entropy than the passwords you're typically used to. Um, there is a solution for generating these passwords called Diceware. I think the website is diceware.com. It has instructions. It has a word list. Um, effectively, you roll a bunch of dice, choose a word from the word list, repeat this step um, until you have enough entropy in your desired password. Um, it's actually pretty easy to remember that XKCD comic is the horse battery staple one, if that sounds familiar. Otherwise, look at the comic. It's pretty funny. Um, I mentioned I use two-factor auth for my email. Uh, it's kind of annoying when you have to wait for an SMS to log in for something or unlock your phone, open up Google Authenticator. Um, these are all good things, and if you don't need to do them too often. It's not actually that annoying. If you do have to two-factor auth significantly often, getting a FIDO U2F device is amazing. I have one in my laptop. You can't even see it because it just fits entirely inside the USB port, unlike the picture here. Um, you just tap it when you get to a two-factor auth prompt, and then you proceed. It's great. Um, it's practically invisible, which is the kind of solution I like. Better security and actually no visible user impact. Um, unless, of course, I don't have my two-factor auth device on me. Um, <laughs> but you can always fall back to an authenticator app or backup codes. And really, if you use two-factor auth, you should have backup codes printed out, kept somewhere safe. Um, my phone got stolen. I got locked out of all of my accounts. I had backup accounts for everything except AWS. Um, and I was fine. It was backup codes. Um, and you see, this is actually a numbered list rather than a bulleted list. Those are my order of preference for two-factor or solutions, um, if you had to choose one. Preferably something that doesn't include SMS because um, identity fraud, some swap fraud. Um, if you do come up against a targeted adversary, um, those are easier to circumvent than the uh, above options. Environment variables, I used to hate them. Um, if you've ever seen a Django crash screen, you see it dumps all of your environment variables. It has stuff to asterisk out anything that contains key, password, a um, couple of things that look sensitive. But think about every other application that you run from your console has access to all of your environment variables. Um, needlessly so. Enter envchain, which is this great thing that I've included the GitHub URL. Um, and to give you a little example of what that looks like, um, if I dump all of my env, uh, environment variables and look for AWS, there's nothing. If I tell envchain I want everything in the AWS namespace, um, to be available to this command and then run env to dump everything, you can see there's my AWS secret key and AWS access key. Um, 
Of course, it's a little bit cumbersome if I want to write env chain AWS, some AWS command that requires a thing. So I just created an alias for those three words. Um, you'll see if I run a S3 command ls without the alias, and that's what the backslash is for. It tells me it's not configured. Um, because I have the alias run it again, S3 command ls, you can see that there's something in that bucket. And the nice thing about the alias is that it means my command completion works again. <laughs> I, I really like completion. You can see I have a fancy shell that implies that I like doing things with my shell. Um, FDE, I mentioned this because really it's just a checkbox when you install your operating system these days unless you use Windows and you have to pay for the expense of Windows. Um, but really there's no noticeable difference having it and not having it, you should really just have it. Backups, um, this is a fun slide that appeared when I was having slide issues. Um, I mentioned having backup codes, but also have backups of your data and think about how you are securing your backups. Because part of information security is being able to access your data when you want to. And if your data's gone, there's no way to access it. So that's not secure. I think we've got time for questions. Or one or two questions? Head. That was loud. Um, hi. Uh, I noticed you didn't mention one password as part of the password managers. Do you have any opinions on that, or is it just I've, an? Uh, I've got nothing against it. I just yeah. haven't used it personally. Um, I, I think I only listed options that I had personally used. Okay, cool. Um, Thanks. <coughs> any other questions on security? None. Cool, thank you very much. Thanks, Storm. <laughs>